Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for what is rather an unplanned video. Uh, my previous video tackled claims made by conspiracy theorists that the Apollo missions wouldn't have had enough oxygen for a trip to the moon and back. And this resulted in a lot of comments from people claiming that I'd made a big mistake about the oxygen used in the cabin. Now, I did make a mistake within the video regarding oxygen. Seemingly, I'd lost the ability to spell it correctly. However, what most people were talking about was at 5 minutes 25 seconds into the video where I said this. Apollo's pure oxygen environment was pressured to only 5 psi. And this prompted two types of comments from people. Some people querying if a pure oxygen atmosphere would be toxic to breathe in, and more people raising the claim that NASA had stopped using a pure oxygen atmosphere after the Apollo 1 fire, and had instead switched to a mix of 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen. Both of these hold some truth to them, but also a lot of misconception, which hopefully we can settle in this video. Ultimately, both of these points come down to the amount of pressure in question. It's all about the pressure of the environment. For example, a very low pressure environment is today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. They aim to make online learning stress-free. Learn at your own pace with hundreds of classes across maths, science and computing. They start with the basics and gradually build up to more complex topics to suit everyone. It explains the concepts of the topics with the aid of very helpful interactive animations and then poses questions to test you. But it doesn't matter if you get the questions wrong because all of them have detailed explanations so you can still learn from it. Answer at least three questions per day to keep a daily streak going and at the time of recording I've just passed 300 consecutive days using Brilliant. Try it for yourself by taking a 30-day free trial using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan and the first 200 people to do so can get 20% off an annual subscription. So firstly, let's cover why a pure oxygen atmosphere isn't necessarily toxic. Pure oxygen can potentially be toxic, but it boils down to how many oxygen molecules you're breathing in. When we talk about air pressure, we're referring to the force that the molecules within the air are exerting on any given area of surface. Air at sea level that we're breathing in is 14.7 pounds per square inch, meaning any square inch of an object, all the molecules of air that are colliding with it are exerting a combined total force of 14.7 pounds. If you were in a room and there was more air pumped into it, then the pressure within the room would increase because the number of molecules within each unit area would also be increasing, and so there would be more molecules colliding with the surfaces at any one time. And vice versa, if the air was then pumped out, the pressure would drop because there would be less molecules in there colliding with the surfaces. However, that pressure is the total of all of the molecules within the air. But our atmosphere is made up of multiple different elements. It's 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and about 1% of other gases. So that total of 14.7 pounds of pressure isn't that each element exerts 14.7 psi of pressure, it's that the force of all of them combined totals 14.7 psi. Only 21% of that force is coming from oxygen molecules, and this is where we get what we call partial pressure. So the molecules of oxygen in the air at sea level create about 3 pounds of pressure per square inch. Nitrogen creates about 11.3 psi and so on. Like how if you were to put a kilogram weight on a table, it would be exerting a force on the table. If you put another kilogram weight next to it, the force exerted on the table will now double, but neither weight is suddenly exerting more force. So if you had a sealed container with 14.7 psi of atmospheric air, and next to it you had an identical sealed container, but which had 3 psi of pure oxygen, both containers would actually have about the same amount of oxygen molecules. So if we were inside those containers and we took a breath, roughly the same number of oxygen molecules would be entering our body. If we had 3 psi of air, 21% of it would be oxygen, so the pressure from the oxygen molecules would only be about 0.63 psi, because there would be so few oxygen molecules and that wouldn't be enough to sustain us. 
So breathing in pure oxygen isn't necessarily toxic, because at low pressures, the actual amount of oxygen isn't that different from what we're used to breathing. Where oxygen toxicity can become a problem is if you are breathing in very high amounts of oxygen. I.e., if you add 14 psi of pure oxygen, that's about five times the number of oxygen molecules compared to regular air. Although even that wouldn't necessarily be toxic unless for very long periods. I mean, saturation divers, for example, these are divers that work at depths down to potentially over a thousand feet deep, where the pressure is more than 10 times that at sea level. To depressurize someone coming up from that depth takes more than a week. So instead of having to do that after every single dive, they are kept in accommodation which is pressurized to their working conditions, and they'll live at that pressure for weeks at a time. So we're talking about living in well over 100 psi environments. For that, they breathe heliox, which is a mixture of helium and oxygen. However, the ratio is not fixed. It gets varied so that the oxygen remains between 0.4 and 0.48 bar which is about 5.8 to 6.9 psi. So saturation divers are essentially breathing in more than twice the amount of oxygen that we are, but for weeks at a time and without any issue. So no, breathing in pure oxygen isn't necessarily toxic, only in high concentrations and for very long periods of time, which 5 psi isn't. Now, let's move on to NASA's use of pure oxygen and Apollo 1. Preceding the Apollo program, there were the Mercury and Gemini programs, and both of these used the same concepts for their cabin atmosphere. Crews breathed pure oxygen in order to save weight, so that they didn't need to have to carry around a load of nitrogen. Now, they didn't want the astronauts breathing in any nitrogen whilst they were on the ground, because once they got into space, the cabin pressure would be decreased and it would risk causing decompression sickness. So you've probably seen the videos of them walking out to be transported to the rocket, and they're carrying a silver case. This carried a pure oxygen supply, so at that point, the astronauts were already breathing pure oxygen, and the regulators within the suit systems would always keep the suit pressure about half a psi higher than the ambient pressure surrounding them. This would ensure if there were any tiny breaches in the suit that the flow would go from inside the suit to outside rather than allowing nitrogen-filled air to get into the suit. And they did the same with the capsule. Once the crew were boarded and the hatch was closed, pure oxygen was pumped into the cabin and purge valves were opened to flush any nitrogen out. These valves were then closed and oxygen would continue to be pumped in until it reached a pressure of 16 psi, so more than 1 psi higher than the ambient air outside. This would ensure that no outside air could get back in. After launch, obviously, the rocket climbs up in altitude where the outside air pressure decreases, so during this time, the environmental controls will begin bringing the cabin pressure down to an eventual target of 5 psi, and the suit pressures were always kept slightly above that. That procedure was used for Mercury and Gemini flights and was intended to continue into the Apollo program. However, in February 1967, during a test for Apollo 1, a fire broke out, which completely destroyed the command module and tragically killed the astronauts. Now, lots of people commenting have said that after that, NASA did away entirely with pure oxygen atmospheres, which isn't the case. What the investigation found was that using pure oxygen at 16 psi was the problem. Fire will consume oxygen, so the more oxygen that you give it, then the more it will burn. The sheer amount of oxygen molecules in 16 psi of pure oxygen basically soaked everything in it, and so it caused materials which aren't normally flammable to become very highly combustible. Subsequent tests found that 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen at 16 psi was much safer, and so this combination was used to pressurize the cabin before launch. During the ascent, the pressure in the cabin was still reduced down, and pure oxygen was still pumped in to flush the nitrogen out, so by the time they reached orbit, they were still in a 5 psi pure oxygen environment which wasn't that dangerous because the ability of fire to burn depends on the amount of oxygen available, and as we've already covered, the actual amount of oxygen in those conditions is not that dissimilar to what we're normally experiencing. 
There is actually an article on NASA's website all about this, although the title is rather confusing, because it's titled 50th Anniversary of NASA Deciding on a Mixed Gas Atmosphere for Apollo, a direct result of the Apollo fire. Which I appreciate, at face value, makes it sound like NASA stopped using pure oxygen altogether. However, the last paragraph of the article opens with, quote, the board concluded that astronauts would continue to breathe pure oxygen in their spacesuits before and during launch to reduce the risk of developing the bends or decompression sickness. Since once in orbit, the command module's environmental control system would gradually reduce the mixed gas atmosphere with pure oxygen and reduce the pressure to 5 psi, standard orbital operating conditions for all US spacecraft at the time. I don't think anybody actually realized how dangerous high concentrations of oxygen were. Like I said, that was the setup used for all of the preceding manned Mercury and Gemini missions. In fact, unbeknownst at the time, Gemini 6 was very close to finding out the hard way just how dangerous it was. Because in the event of an abort, the Gemini capsules had ejection seats for both astronauts, similar to fighter planes. Gemini 6 was planned to launch on the 12th of December 1965. However, one and a half seconds after the engines ignited, they suddenly shut down. Now, because the mission clock had already begun, protocol called for Commander Wally Shearer to pull the ejection handle. However, he decided against doing it because the rocket hadn't started lifting off the pad at that point. Had he done so, the pyrotechnics for the ejection seat would have actually ignited the cabin atmosphere and everything within it that had been soaking in oxygen. Again, not because the cabin was in pure oxygen, but because it was at such high pressure that there was a huge amount of oxygen molecules. So the use of pure oxygen at high pressure was dropped after Apollo 1. However, the use of low pressure pure oxygen once in space continued because it wasn't really any more combustible than regular air at sea level. And such a fundamental change to the atmosphere would have caused huge delays in the program. Not only would the command module supply system need to be changed, but the lunar module and the EVA suits had all been designed for years around using a pure oxygen atmosphere. So low pressure pure oxygen actually remained throughout the remaining Apollo missions. You can even see mentions of it within the radio transcripts. For example, during Apollo 11, after they docked with the lunar module, at 3 hours 43 minutes, Michael Collins comments that they are pressurizing the lunar module to equalize the pressure between the two modules before they remove the hatches. And he mentions the O2 valve, which is oxygen, and that while the command module cabin pressure should be 5 psi, it's dropped to 4.4 and that they want to use additional oxygen to bring the command module back up to 5 psi. Following the termination of the Apollo moon program in 1972, NASA did begin to move away from using pure oxygen. For the Skylab space station in 1973 and 74, they kept the pressure of 5 psi, but they dropped the oxygen concentration to about 74% with 26% nitrogen. This is closer to the level of oxygen that we have on Earth because the crew were there for much longer periods of time than any of the moon missions. Although in 1975, they did fly one last pure oxygen flight where the Apollo command module docked with a Soviet Soyuz capsule. Now, the Soyuz capsules used nitrogen oxygen at 15 psi, so they had to have a docking module in between the two craft to act as an airlock so that the crew could move between the two different atmospheres. That was the last flight of an Apollo command module. After which, the space shuttle was put into development, and from then on, NASA did use regular atmosphere environments. So there we go. Hopefully that has cleared things up now. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.